let's take a look at performance. We always like to start the performance with the review of new frontier indices, six global and six US indices, ranging from 2080 to OFD, because they are constructed in exactly the same way as our core investment strategies, and therefore describe the performance of strategies in real time. Indices returns are provided by S&P Dow Jones. So two charts in front of us are showing the, perform the performance of new frontier indices along with the blended benchmarks in Q1 and over the past year. So 2021 started with multiple good news. Uh, we have greater than expected stimulus package and massive vaccine rollout, which has pushed US stocks higher during the first quarter. Yields rallied as expectations of economic growth increased along with inflation expectations. As we can see from here, uh, all new frontier global and US indices reached all time highs during the first quarter as aggressive indices did better than conservative ones and US indices outperformed global ones. While relative performance against the benchmark uh, were mixed for the quarter, all indices beat their benchmarks on a one year basis, ranging from two to 10% across the board. It's worth mentioning here that with US stocks continue outperforming international stocks for multiple quarters, our global indices here still beat the US blended benchmarks over a one year period. Both global and US uh, 60 40 indices with the most balanced exposure to different asset classes was up 1.6% and 2.9% for this quarter respectively. While traditional hedges like gold and long treasuries were among the top contributors in 2020, they did not help this quarter, which in part explained the underperformance uh, compared to the benchmark. The strongest relative performance came from US equity index, which was up 7% 7, uh, 7 this quarter, outperforming the S&P 500 by 1% in Q1 and almost 10% over the past year. And to get a better picture of the growth of our indices starting from the beginning of 2020 to March 20, uh, 2021, we have the plot of global and US equity indices as well as 640 indices in front of us. It is now over a year since the downturn uh, we have experienced in March. And the global equity index indicated by light yellow here was up 83% since then, 21% since its pre-pandemic -pre high and returned 23% in total during this time period. 6040 indices, um, both global and, and, and the US, on the other hand, were less volatile compared with all equity indices. Uh, global and US 6040 have returned 16% and 18% respectively since January 2020. Now we have reviewed new frontier indices. Now let's move on to new frontier strategies. What we have here uh, in the chart is our net of fee performance for global core portfolios during this quarter and over one year period, along with their benchmarks. Now, I think it's very easy to distinguish between one year and Q1 performance. As we have mentioned, Q1 was a good time for investing in risky assets rather than assets that hedge risks. Consequently, aggressive global core portfolios all perform the benchmarks well conservative and balanced portfolios uh, underperformed this quarter. Since it's just over a year since last March, it's not too surprising to see double digit returns for one year, ranging from 11% to 58%. This is how much we have recovered from the bottom. And this is great for investors who have stayed uh, investing with us. With that being said, uh, one cannot optimistically expect this wonderful one-year performance to continue in the future. So it's more realistic to step back and look at extended period of time from January 2020 to March 2021, which includes the market downturn. We have seen an, a V-shaped curve for, um, for our indices earlier, and this chart shows the global core portfolios rebounded above the pre-pandemic levels with annualized returns ranging from 5.7% to almost 18%. And the outperformance against the benchmarks were up to 2% during this, during this time period. And for global core, I want, I want to add here that we, we rebalanced the portfolios in February 
and of, of which the major thing was locking gains from growth stocks and risk management to reduce concentration from risky assets while bringing portfolios back to their risk target. Without rebalancing, an existing investor uh, who, investing, who is investing with us uh, in 60-40, for example, would have a portfolio that drifted away uh, from the target to roughly 65% equity allocation at the end of Q1. And you may wonder, and a portfolio with more concentration in equities has posted strong returns in the past few quarters. But these returns are not without high risks. And not all investors can tolerate the significant risk inherent within equities. Our aggressive profiles are roughly 1.5 times uh, more risky than our balance uh, portfolios and 3.5 times more risky than conservative portfolios as measured by annualized historical standard deviations over the long term. The drifting portfolio by nature is more risky than an, than an optimal portfolio and without proper risk control for some time, you will expose clients to more risk than desired. So rebalancing, um, the, the purpose of rebalancing is really about risk control, not for, not for maximized returns. We wanna make sure that portfolio's risk level always align consistently with investors' risk targets. And next is our tax sensor. Uh, new fund tax sensor portfolios are managed uh, with the same investment process with the um, global core, um, but with considerations into after tax returns. So as expected, uh, they performed largely in line with the global core portfolios in Q1, but did relatively better thanks to the allocation to municipal bonds. Compared to other bond segments, U.S. municipal bonds held up really well uh, in the first quarter during the rate rally, uh, supported by a stimulus package. As reflected in the chart, our aggressive tax sensitive portfolios all perform the benchmark by 14 to 16 basis points for the quarter, while other risk profiles slightly underperformed. On a one-year basis, all risk profiles all paid the benchmark by 1 to 3%. Next is our multi-asset income portfolios. And they are constructed to provide a sustainable and reliable source of income that grows with the economic needs over time. In terms of total returns, multi-asset income portfolios continue to recover by 3.3 to 8% this quarter. Despite lagging the dividend intensive benchmark that's heavily tilting to financials, our multi-asset income portfolio still outperformed most of our competitors all there in the platform for this quarter. And, and, and in Q1, people were concerned about inflation. So in the context of higher inflation expectation, uh, our multi-asset income portfolio is optimized over different asset classes to diversify across different risks, including inflation risk, credit risk, and as such, reduce the overall portfolio risk. And currently, the yields for our portfolios are around 3.3%, which is more than 2% uh, yield on US ag and more than twice the yield on the broad global equity market. And so that's our index and portfolio performance. Now let's take a look at assets we hold in the portfolio. First, we have fixed income. And overall for, for Q1, uh, fixed income market struggled. The yield on the 10-year treasury rose to 1.74%, 1 1.93% in the beginning of the year, and the yield curve steepened further over the quarter. The U.S. core bond market fell 3.4%, uh, and the U.S. Treasury finished its quarter, uh, and finished its worst quarter since uh, 1980, followed by investment grade corporate bonds. The decline in U.S. Treasuries has turned one-year return into negative, uh, while U.S. corporate bonds were still up roughly 8% from a year ago. High yield, on the other hand, was the only bond segment that stayed positive. International treasuries and emerging bonds posted negative returns this quarter, in part due to the strength in US dollar, which was up 4% this quarter. And I would like to add some color to high yield bonds in the context of rising rates environment. We know high yield bonds are affected by rising yield, by rising rates and rising yields, just like other high quality bonds, but usually less so, because they tend to have shorter duration and higher coupons. As we can see from the chart, 
green bar and blue bar each represents yield to worst and duration. The yellow dot here denotes the yield to worst per unit of duration. And then we can see high yield has the highest um, per, per unit of duration among different bond segments. And this chart helps explain some of bond returns we saw in Q1. Next, our equities. This was another quarter uh, of gains for most equity markets, though the gains were not as dramatic as we had in 2020. Um, with rising hopes on, on the economic reopening, value and small caps have continued on the strong run since October, whereas growth, which have benefited much from the low rate environment and work from home norms, came under increased pressure. Large cap value was up 11.3%, outperforming the large cap growth by the biggest margin in 20 years. Small cap value with the 21% gain was the top performer as well as the biggest contributor to the performance for this quarter. The dividend stocks um, also had a good quarter. Meanwhile, stronger prospect of economic growth also boosted stronger performance from the US relative to the international markets. But Europe um, held up really well in the light of the strength in US dollars. China, which has been um, a really beneficial component of the portfolio in 2020, was almost flat this quarter. Hedging assets like gold um, ended in the negative territory this quarter, bringing its year, one year return to the single digits. So in conclusion, we had an overall good quarter to start 2021 with concerns and uncertainties 